Hey, good morning. Did y'all know it's raining again? My back and my neck and my arm are telling me it's raining. That's not the only clue. I can hear it on the roof. So today, today, we're going to do something that I love. We are going to share amazing things happening in your community. We're going to share some really cool stuff that I got to be a part of this weekend. And I have to tell you, over your church did an amazing, amazing job. We're going to share some photos in just a little bit. Oh my gosh, Jenny Byers invited me to this event. This is the fourth year it's happened. And sad to say, I wasn't there for the first three years because I didn't know what was going on, but it was going on right in downtown ball ground. And the place was packed. They had a barbecue lunch for the price of your ticket. You got a barbecue lunch and you got to enjoy a wonderful play or skit done by a lady from church. She just had this revelation that she wanted to do this for a camp that the church was doing. And she wrote the script and they did it. And so we're sitting there and we're enjoying it and it's good. And we're going, oh, cute. Oh, this is sweet. Oh, and they incorporate Bible verses. Oh, this is neat. And then it gets to the end. And you're like, wow, this is what it's all about. So the cold chills were, woo, it was, it was just, it was amazing. It was really cool and it was showing that the devil was defeated. The devil will be defeated, but we have to work hard to defeat the devil because the devil keeps showing up and he's dressed sometimes as a woman. He's dressed sometimes as a man. He's dressed sometimes. We never know what kind of thing he's going to come in, but in this play, he, it, was, it was so, so cool. And in the end, he was converted because he was saved. And that was really, really cool. So I have asked them if there's any way possible we could recreate this skit here at the studio. I don't know if we can do it or not, but we're talking about it. And I think it would be amazing to share it with all of y'all because all of y'all didn't get to come. But they had two shows, one at lunch on Saturday, and that's where we were. And then Saturday night, and I might add, it was packed, which is really, really cool and really good because they're raising money for camp for church kids. And I loved it. And to Ofer, y'all did an amazing job. And I don't know whose pound cake I tasted, but one of you ladies nailed it with the pound cake. It was so good. <laughs> it was so good. Now, these are the photos. This is as the skit began, and we just weren't sure where this was going. We thought it was going to be a fun little something. Well, it was more than fun. It was inspirational. It was very, very emotional, and it was really, really cool. And, um, yeah, boy, was I glad I got to be involved in that. And I just, I loved each person had their part was just the sweetest thing. And, and I just, I loved every minute of it. So to over. Y'all, great job, amazing. And this is just um, a little church outside ball ground and uh, they did a really, really good job. And to Dinah West who was helping with this and, and sadly, I can't remember the young lady's name who wrote the skit, but it was so sweet. And, and to everybody who was part of it, it, it was just, it was awesome. It was just, I cannot say enough good about it. I don't know anything I've done lately that I enjoyed this much and uh, it was just priceless. It was precious and the fact that I was with some of my dear, dear friends, the Bells of Ball Ground helped it a little bit because they always make you smile and make you feel happy and that's what life is about. Gather with your friends, do things that you love and make those special memories because you know what? We are not guaranteed tomorrow. Yesterday the visiting preacher was preaching and he held out his arm and he counted 10 seconds and he said, in 10 seconds, I think it was 33,000 people will pass away. Think about that, y'all. In 10 seconds, we could be one of those 33,000 people. And um, the world is changing. The world is changing greatly. And sadly, we need to be a part of making the world a better place to live, not a worse place to live. Not a worse place to live. But... Again, if you didn't get to come to this play, I, I feel bad that I don't know how much more we could have advertised it because the tickets were all sold out, but it was just, it was precious. It was priceless. And the end of it, the end of it is just like the way we want our life to end. The end of it is heaven. And the end of it is you have a choice. You can decide to follow Satan and you can be Satan's child. And I know a bunch of people that must like Satan a lot. Or you could be 
saved and you can be Jesus' child. And it just, oh my gosh, it was, it was, yeah, it was amazing. It was, even Satan turned her life around. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was awesome. Awesome. Now, probably my favorite photo of the day, we had some folks from Ducktown, Tennessee sneak into ball ground for a visit and it was precious. It was awesome, and uh, now we're back to the play. But And this is my favorite scene, and sadly the shadows were not perfect, but what a beautiful scene. This is at Farmer's Crossing, the ridge. This is what your view when you build your new home at Farmer's Crossing will look like. The view is amazing, absolutely amazing. And I can't tell you what a joy it was to get to show Ron and Shirley everything about ball ground, the progress and the amazing things happening. And uh, just it was just a good, good, good day. So um, just a, a happy day filled with a lot of, lot of love and a lot of laughter. Now that's my favorite view. And yesterday was probably one of the clearest days, so it was a perfect day to do photography. But look at that beautiful blue sky. And pretty soon the trees will all be green because they're getting there, they're getting there. But just a joy. And look at that baby. Now she's seven months and two weeks old and she has rocked the world. Everybody who meets and knows her loves her. And boy, do we love that baby. She is sweet as sugar and good as she can be. And boy, we like that about her too. <laughs> So just a sweet, sweetheart. And she loves Miss Evelyn. She loves her Auntie Evelyn. She just, when she sees Evelyn, she starts laughing and giggling and she's happy. And she got to meet Caden yesterday. And uh, that's some of the sinful things that uh, were eaten yesterday. And yeah, I, I think I know somebody who ate about three of them. I didn't taste them. I didn't touch them. I was good. So... But we also have um, some more pictures, I think, of the food. Have we got more pictures of food? What happened? Okay, well, we'll get to them later. Today we're going to share something with you that I think we all need. This is um, when we go from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. We know what the passage of, of the Lord was during that time. We know what he was going through. We know how life changed for all of us. And we know what that cross means. And in the play Saturday, when they started bringing out the cross, we knew it was going to get real. We knew it was going to be one of those emotional moments because if you don't know that cross and your life ends today, if you don't know the Lord and your life ends today, then you probably won't have a good ending. But if you know him and you know that Easter is that day that we all look forward to because there is an empty tomb. There is an empty tomb. That is such good news on this rainy, dreary day. That is such good news. We're going to share Matt Dibler's message that he delivered at Fields of the Wood. Um, this was way back when we had the big motor home and we drove it to the studio, picked Matt up. He was running late. He was supposed to do the show with us. He got lost. He, he fell asleep. It was just a miserable, miserable trip for him for, and from Missouri. But we took him to Fields of the Wood and pulled up there, and he'd never seen the place, wasn't sure what he was going to see. And Ed Huber and I talked about this recently. As we pulled in in the motorhome, I have not forgotten with Matt Dibler singing lead was playing in the um, audio system. We had no idea that they even played their music. And it was just, it was so, it was, it was like so real that you're like, this can only be ordained by God. This is going to be a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. It was cloudy, it was overcast, but it was, it was not cold. It was just pleasant, and we had a lot of our viewers standing there on the ridge waiting for us when we got there, and they all stood and listened as Matt delivered this message. It is a message of hope, and I think in today's world, we need a message of hope. We need a little bit of hope for everybody because everybody is facing something. Everybody is facing something. You might be facing something that is self-inflicted. You might have an alcohol problem. You might have a drug problem. You might be doing something that you did to yourself that is really stupid, but we can all get through it. We can all get through it, and the choice is ours. So we know that there is an answer to every single problem and every single prayer. We don't always like the answers, 
but we know that there is an answer. And the answer is in the same delivery that came in the play, the answer is turning your life over to, Lord, to the Lord and just saying, I want to be yours and I want to get through this time. I'm going to survive this time that I thought would kill me. So no matter what you're facing, today is the day for you to sit back, watch Matt Dibler, call your friends, call your neighbors, say, hey, Sherry's favorite message is on today. And it really was my favorite message. He did a great job of delivering a message at a place he'd never seen, and he was ready. So we're going to spend some time with him. Then I'll be back. We're going to share some good music with you, and then we're going to share a little bit more of why we need to go visit Fields of the Wood. I'll be back shortly. Verse number 9, and it's a great passage of Scripture on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, Toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the, the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel said, the angel answered and said, Unto the women, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was, was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. I want to read another passage, and it's basically John's point of view from the same uh, passage of Scripture, and well, actually the same account in the Scripture. And I want to read just a few verses here in verse number 1 through 20, or 1 through 10 of uh, John chapter 10. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto him, them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher, and he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet uh, went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. In this passage of scripture, we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, out here on this, in this beautiful place down behind where the camera is standing right there, and is the, the, uh, it's just a replica of the garden tomb where Jesus actually was buried over, uh, overseas, of course, we know that. And there's an empty tomb there just as this is the same. There's not a body there. There's not a replica of a body there because Jesus is not there. He is risen. And, uh, you know, in this day and time with Hollywood and all the special effects, it almost desensitizes those of us that believe in Christ to the real fact of this being a true story. It's not just a fic uh, fiction. It's not something that's made up. It's not a fairy tale. It's a true story that Jesus has risen. And it's interesting, the events of here, but my question is, I read a passage of Scripture sometimes, I'll say, now what does this mean to me today? And what does this mean to me as I look down and as I'm speaking, which is really the first time I've ever had the privilege to speak looking at an empty tomb while we're, we're here gathered together? And what does that mean to me? What does that mean as a child of God? And I'll end up with a passage of Scripture that will share some of those thoughts as well. But what it means to me is several different things. What does that empty tomb preach to me? It preaches to me three simple things. One, 
it, it proves, it, it's, it's a message of proof, and that is that Jesus is who he said he was. Up to this point, his earthly ministry being three and a half years, and we, we kind of measure the span of time that he was probably 33 years old when he passed away or in that neighborhood. Uh, what does that mean to me? What does an empty tomb mean? It means everything that he said that he was during that time is true. Uh, he said, I and my father are one. He said several different things that would proclaim his own deity, that he wasn't just a man, as some people would say, he's just a good man. Well, I submit to you that if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, he wasn't a good man because he bore false witness if he wasn't who he said he was. So either you believe that he's God or you believe that he is a liar. And the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And the empty tomb supports the fact that he is who he said he was and, and who, he's, who he said he is because he still is. Uh, I like what he said. He said, I'm alive forevermore. When he rose again, he rose again never to die. And he only died because he chose to die for everybody that will ever be born on the face of the earth. I'm glad that it t proves to me that he was God. I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of David when he went out after Goliath. His purpose, he, remember the, the question he asked the men around that were gathered around as they were afraid of Goliath. He said, is there not a cause? And we wonder what that cause was. What was it that caused this young man to go out after Goliath? And he says that all the world may know that there is a God in Israel. And that was, in other words, it was a, the cause was proof that God is God and he's going to take care of his people. The empty tomb is a proof that we have believed the right thing. We, ha we don't have to wonder, do we trust the wrong thing? Now, if, if our Savior had died and never come out of the grave, as he said he would come out, well, then we wouldn't have anything to believe in. But I'm glad that I know that I know that he's out of that tomb. I don't have to go over there because I accept it by faith. But many people have been there and know that he's not there. So number one, it's proof that he is who he said he is. Number two, we see that not only is it proof, but it's a, a message of power. I'm glad we don't serve, and I, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but I'm glad I don't serve a wimpy God. We serve a God that has done what no other man can do or has ever done or ever will do, and that is he came and he rose up from the grave. He said this in the scriptures, he says that I have power to lay my life down. Nobody took his life, he freely gave his life. And then as we think about that, he, he freely gave it, he had power to lay his life down, and he had power to take it back up, the Bible says. I love the words what Paul said when he said this, that I may know him, that I may know him, and I love these words right here, and the power of his resurrection. See, I don't think we realize what power is demonstrated in an empty grave. Nobody in the world, I don't care how powerful they are, it doesn't matter how rich they are, it doesn't matter how strong they are, it doesn't matter who they are, it doesn't matter what family they come from, it doesn't matter if they're royalty or if they're beggars, it makes no difference. Nobody has the power of life. Remember back in the Garden of Eden, God created man, and as he created Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We, there's only one in the universe that has that power, and that's our God. And that testimony of that uh, empty grave is exactly what that's preaching to us, is that there's proof that he is who he said he is, and then also it's power, and he's, do, he's done what no other man can do. Uh, what a powerful God we serve. All power is given to him in heaven and in earth, the Bible says. So we serve a powerful God. And, and you say, well, is this a message of hope? Of course it is. If he's able to uh, have life, then he's able to have healing. He's able to have not only physical healing, but financial healing and uh, family healings. We, we look at all the people that are going through troubles in their families. We go look at that same God that had the life to, uh, had the power to resurrect uh, his own son out of the grave. That same God can take care of your finances and can take care of your family and can take care of everything that you'll ever face. So that's a powerful God. Then we think of this final point. We think of this right here. This is a tremendous thought. What a great thought that it is. Is Not only is he who he said he is, not only has he done what nobody else can do, but I love this, this thought there, and it's a message of promise. He'll do what he said he would do. Over in John chapter 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, 
that where I am, there ye may be also. That's a promise. Now, I couldn't have hope in that promise of that if he was still in the grave. I'm so thankful today that we serve a risen Savior and that he, when he came out of that grave, he says, you know what? I'm doing exactly what I said I would do. I said I would lay my life down and take it back up, and that's what I've done. He is he's a God of honor. He's a God of honesty. And he said, I promised you I'd do this. So all promises then that we know that have not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled because he's promised that he would lay down his life and take it up. He did that. And so that's the basis and the foundation of the honesty and the promises of God. Every promise in this Bible will come true. And the next promise on the agenda of Christ is this right here. He's coming to pick me up and take me home. I, I used to think about that when my, my mom and dad were divorced, and I'm not belly aching and I'm not whining about that. I'm thankful for the applications that I can receive from that. Every other Friday, my father would come, and he would uh, pick me up and take me home for the weekend to his house, and I'd spend the weekend with my dad. And uh, in the summertime, we'd go camping for a week, and we just would have a great time. I remember as a young man thinking and hearing my dad drive his car down our, our dirt road as he would come to our house and how excited I would be. And I think of that and I think about my wonderful Savior. This world's in a mess. This world, even lost people in this world know that the world can't continue on the way it is. Our world scene is just in such an uproar. And let me say this, it's not, the answer is not in the Democratic Party or the Republican. It makes no difference what, what branch of government you support. It comes down to this, we're, we're not even in a governmental warfare anymore. What we're in is spiritual warfare. And the world is crying out for a redeemer, not for some organizer, not for some uh, economist that will fix all our problems. We need a spiritual revival in our land. Well, that empty tomb proves that we serve a risen Savior and that His promises are true. The Bible says when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. That's a promise. Uh, there's promises in Scripture that talk about what the world's going to go through and those that are not believers in Christ are going to go through some terrible things in the future. But you and I that are saved, because of that promise being fulfilled, all the other promises will be fulfilled. So right now, as a child of God, I'm just waiting for my Heavenly Father to send His Son to come by and pick me up and take me home. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, as Thessalonians tells us. What a promise. All the promises that you read in the Bible are true. They're just waiting to take place, and we know they will take place because, I mean, look at the proof. You know, we used to use the old phrase, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, people can brag about a lot of different things, but the fact of the matter is, God, Christ is the only one that come out of the grave. He, he became what the Bible says, the first fruits. What promises? There's promises, and we won't get into every one of them. But one thing that blesses my heart is every time, it's a sad time when we stand at the foot of a grave of a loved one. That is so hard. But what a promise we have uh, because our Savior lives. He said, because I live, ye shall live also. See what we're talking about? There's that promise. Again, I can't give hope to people, uh, those that have buried their loved ones, if, if I have a Savior that's still in the grave. He said he would come out of the grave, and he did, praise the Lord. And because of that, I have no reservations telling somebody we'll see them again. We'll see that loved one again because of an empty grave, not because of me as a preacher, not because of a denomination, but because this Bible teaches us and tells us and the world knows that there's an empty grave and because of that, the promises are true. Boy, that's, that's rejoicing ground. That's shouting ground to say, hey, thank God for His grace and His mercy, but thank God for His promises that He's already fulfilled and the ones that He will fulfill. I want to share with you a passage of Scripture in Corinthians that is, is just kind of just sums it up better than I could ever say it myself. In 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 15, verse 12, it kind of gives us the question, well, what if he hadn't come out of the grave? And I think it's a good way to conclude this message. It says in verse number 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse number 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. <laughs> you see what he's saying? If Christ didn't come out of the tomb, if he didn't come, if that grave is still 
fulfilled with it's filled up with a body if that's the case what I'm doing right here is foolishness it's just silly because we have no foundation for our religion we've based it on a lie but thank God that's not the case because we based it on truth he is truth and he did come out so if he's not risen then our preaching is vain our faith is vain everybody here that believes in Christ it's ridiculous to believe in Christ if he didn't come out of the grave is what he's saying here and then it goes on to say here yea and we are found false witnesses of God what's that mean we're a bunch of liars if Jesus didn't come out of the grave. And then he goes on to say this, because we have testified, every one of us that believe in Christ have testified to someone in our lifetime that we serve a risen Savior. And as we do that, because we've done that, we've, we've actually lied if that tomb is still uh, holding the body of our Savior. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is uh, not Christ raised and if Christ be not raised your faith is vain and listen to this one ye are yet in your sins one of the greatest joys in my life is to know that my sins are forgiven that is a thrill to my soul to know that my sins are forgiven the Bible says there's an old song that says this living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever that's that's a wonderful thought uh, we are justified because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we would still be in our sins if he didn't come out of that grave. And then verse number 18 says, Then they would, uh, listen here, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. They're, they're gone. They're perished. In the, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If Christ be not raised. Now wouldn't it be a sad story if that's where that passage of Scripture stopped? I couldn't share with the singletons the message of hope that we have if that's where that passage of Scripture stopped. I couldn't share that message with my brother and as we stood there at the foot of his little three-year-old daughter. I couldn't do that with, at my mother's grave at 57 years old as a, as a young mother and she passed away young. Uh, I, I look at that and I think, you know, boy, we'd be miserable if we didn't have hope. Some of you have buried your own spouses and how terrible that would be but you look down over that hill and you look at that grave over there. Because that grave is empty, we have a message of hope. Listen to what the Bible says. If the, if the verses stopped right there, then we would be miserable. But look, verse 20 says this, But now, I love the tense, I love the grammar of our Bible. It's so up to date. But now, right now, today, in 2011, 2000 now is Christ risen from the dead not only 2,000 years ago but he still lives now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept what does that mean because he lives your loved ones will live my loved ones will live what a message of hope what a message that we can share with all these folks that don't have that hope let me tell you this if Christ conquered death hell and the grave he can handle your problems he can take care of every one of them. They're just things. But the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We serve a risen Savior. We know songs. Up from the grave He arose with a mighty triumph o'er His foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and He lives forever with the saints to reign. What a thought. Low in the grave He lay, waiting that coming day. Those songs are all based on a risen Savior. And we have that risen Savior. And thank God today we have hope because of a living risen Savior. Not just back then was He a risen Savior, but now is Christ risen today. And if I read that 20 years from now, He'll still be living and He's alive forevermore. And I thank God that I serve a risen Savior. Because of that, I can offer you hope. And we are saved to a lively hope because He's alive. Now let's share that message with a world that needs to hear we've got a positive proof I mean we've got proof that he lives he did what he he he, he is who he said he is we have the fact of the power he's done what no man what nobody else can do and he can still do that and then we also have the promise he will do what he said that he would do he's gonna come by remember we're just waiting on him to come by and pick us up and take us home what a day glorious day that's going to be. I think it would be good if we just took just a second and sang a little bit of a song right here. 
because it just fits because there's coming that day. And I think the folks here could probably just join in. I don't know if the microphone will pick up with it, but you can imagine their voices singing and you can sing with us right there in your home as we sing this little song right here. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. And there'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain. No more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. See, that song's a promise. What a day, glorious day that's going to be. And I, I tell you, the, the Bible says, you know, Paul, as you study the Bible, we get a beautiful picture of heaven. We know the gates of pearl, the street of gold, mansions, and all these things. And in your mind's eye, you think of a beautiful place. But I love what Paul said. He was caught up to the third heaven. He didn't know if it was a vision or if it was in reality, but he knew something about it. He, he got a glimpse of glory. And as he got a glimpse of glory, he made this statement. I'm not, he said, I'm not permitted to tell you what all that I saw. He said, but I can tell you this much, and I love this, the half has not been told. Folks, we're going to have a reunion. We're going to have a wonderful time in heaven. It's all because of an empty grave. Father, thank you for your grace and your goodness unto us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for these folks that have come out, and I pray, Lord, they've received a blessing and maybe some encouragement. Lord, we serve you, a God that has uh, resurrected our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm glad that, Father, we believe in him as our personal Savior. And I pray for anybody that may be watching that the Holy Spirit would touch their heart if they've never accepted Christ, that they would be saved. Father, we've got the message of hope. There is proof because of the resurrection. There is power because of the resurrection. And the promises are true all because of the resurrection. Father, we do look forward to the day that you'll come by and pick us up and take us home. What a day that's going to be in Christ's name. Amen. Once on a hillside, people were gathered, hoping to see him as thousands were fed. He touched the blind eye. He healed broken spirits. He moved with compassion, and he raised up the dead. Once on a hillside, people were gathered watching as Jesus was crucified. No one showed mercy to the one who had healed them. Yet Jesus loved them as he suffered and died. But once on a hillside, 
people were gathered, for Jesus had risen and soon would ascend. And then as he blessed them, he rose toward the heaven. But he left us this promise that he'd come back again. And we shall see Jesus just as they saw him. There is no greater promise than this when he returns with power and glory we shall see jesus we shall see jesus just as he is. Whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella Day, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ, how may I serve you? The mountains are calling and they're closer than you think. Farmers Crossing in Ball Ground offers Creekside lots with homes beginning in the 400s. Walking distance to downtown shopping, dining, tennis courts, Calvin Farmer Park, and local events. It also includes a beautiful hike to Long Swamp Creek. Leave the car and the worries behind. Move in by fall 2023. Call Sherry Martin at 404-375-0590 or Evelyn Calhoun at 770-733-0779. Whether you're swimming in the sea or splashing in the pool, making a masterpiece or just making memories, writing a great American novel or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow, whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. Hi, I'm Ryan Blaney, a third generation race car driver. And we dedicate a lot of our time to going as fast as possible. But when my grandpa was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it was a very unexpected bump in the road for us. It's important to notice if older family members are acting differently, experiencing problems with their memory, or having trouble with routine tasks. Early detection of Alzheimer's can give your family time to explore support services, make a plan for the future, and access available treatments. 
If you or your family are noticing changes, it could be Alzheimer's. Talk about seeing a doctor together. Since I was a child, I long for Sunday and to hear those church bells ring, calling one and all into the choir, singing praises to the King. We would sing what a friend we have in Jesus. He has set me free. Just as I am, there's power in the blood and love lifted me. We sing that old hymn, I'll fly away, my feet will hardly stay on the ground. Shouts of joy fill the air with the hymn, Amazing Grace. I was lost, but now I'm found. There's just something about a spirit-filled choir that feels a longing in me. It lifts me above the cares of this world and sets my spirit free. You enjoy those old songs, say amen. Lost men and women, they make their way to Jesus, convicted by a song they have heard. The message comes across when it's sung with feeling, it puts power in the words. What a blessed thought when I get to heaven, I'll be singing with the angel band. When David strikes a chord, we'll all sing together there in that heavenly land. When we sing that old hymn, I'll fly away. My feet will hardly stay on the ground. Shouts of joy fill the air with the hymn, Amazing Grace. I was lost, but now I'm found. There's just something about a spirit-filled choir that feels a longing in me. It lifts me above the cares of this world and sets my spirit free. There's just something about a spirit-filled choir that feels a longing in me. It lifts me above the cares of this world and sets my spirit free. Lost men and women, they make their way to Jesus, convicted by a song they have heard. The message comes across when it's sung with feeling, it puts power in the words. What a blessed thought when I get to heaven, I'll be singing with the angel man. When David 
white stripes of glory, we'll all sing together there in that heavenly land. When we sing that old hymn, I'll fly away, my feet will hardly stay on the ground. Shouts of joy fill the air with the hymn Amazing Grace, I was lost, but now I'm found. There's just something about a spirit-filled choir that feels a longing in me. It lifts me above the cares of this world and sets my spirit free. There's just something about a spirit-filled choir that feels a longing in me. It lifts me above the cares of this world and sets my spirit free. Now, let me introduce you people. If you don't know Southern Gospel music, that is Southern Gospel music. That is when Southern Gospel music was the best. The inspirations as we saw them enjoyed them for many, many, many years. And I want to ask everybody to please continue praying for Archie Watkins. He owns the inspirations now, and he sadly had a small stroke. I'm not sure what the results have been. I got to call Cindy and find out just what is going on right now. But last week he had a small stroke and um, he has not been on the road. The younger guys, the new inspirations who are bringing it to, I mean, they are bringing it guys. They are doing Southern gospel music just like the original guys did. It is fantastic. If you have not, have not had an opportunity to go see the new inspirations, go see them and you will be tickled pink. Now, I got tickled pink Friday night because the um, American Legion Post 4, 4, 149 out of Jasper um, invited me and a guest to come and be with them Friday night and I absolutely, we were blown away. What a great, great show. What a great spirit. What a great night to end with God Bless the USA. Of course, that was perfect because we were saluting and honoring our veterans. Connor Laurie did a great job. He was, it was amazing. It was amazing. And y'all, my neck just popped. I've got a little problem that I got to get resolved and it is, oh my gosh. Woo! <laughs> I heard it. I bet they heard it in my mic. I bet they heard it. But anyway, woo, that hurt. <laughs> ah! um, today has been a day of reflection. Today has been a day of remembering. Today has been a day of good gospel music. And I want to share just a little bit of an interview that I did. Ed Huber invited me to come up to Fields of the Wood. I've been there many, many trips. Love it. Love the peaceful spirit about it. Love everything about what it stands for. And I want you to listen to him as we talk just a few minutes about what that place really meant. And as we approach Easter, there's not a better time to load your family up and go to Fields of the Wood. So uh, make plans. I hope that the weather's going to break this week and we're going to have some good sunny days and it would be a perfect time to take a picnic and go up there and visit. So right now we're going to go to Ed Huber and I. Just as we visited, um, it was quite a few years ago. You'll notice that. What's the name of this town, man? This is, this is uh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> it's in okay. North Carolina. We right. just came out of Turtletown, and we are in uh, North Carolina. I guess you would call it Hiawassee Dam. It's mm -hmm. part of Hiawassee Dam anyway. And I've been here five times this year. In the last, well, in the, about the last 18 months, I've come here five times. And um, we are in Fields of the Woods, which many people won't even know exists. Now, I remember hearing stories about 
pilgrimages here where there were thousands of people and cars parked for a mile. And every time I've been here, it's me and a couple other people. What's going on here? Tell me a little history. Well, uh, when you look at the history of the organization, it was started in 1884 by a Baptist pastor or preacher named R.G. Sperling. And the early church uh, was started as the uh, Christian uh, Union. It was called the Christian Union. And Pastor Sperling had prayed for two years for revival. And in 1886, uh, eight people joined the reunion or the union. And his son, R.G. Sperling Jr., was also baptized and began to preach as well, or ordained. And they started a new organization, of course, called the Christian Union. Mm -hmm. uh, it then went for about 10 years, and in that 10-year period, they prayed for revival, prayed for revival, didn't grow much. But you have to imagine what this place must have looked like now, 1884. Okay, 1884, people travel by wagon. Even by wagon was difficult because, mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at mountains, uh, even horseback. Most of the time, I say most of the people traveled by walking. Okay. So the dedication was there. <clears throat> and the uh, the resistance, of course, was there to, to uh, R.G. Sperling. Now, we are here where North Carolina and Tennessee meet. Right on the line, virtually. Okay. All right. Now, the resistance he met, um, there was some violence. Can you talk a little bit about so that? It was terrible violence. And I take this from a book called Like a Mighty Army, which was written by Charles W. Kahn, who was part of the Church of God. Mm -hmm. And according to Mr. Kahn, and he did a lot of research and talked to a lot of people uh, that still live in this area that were related, uh, offspring of the Spurlings and others that were in the initial church. And yes, there was a lot of resistance uh, as far as people being beaten with whips, uh, buildings being burned down. Uh, because the of their different religion or because of they wanted to exercise their right to religion? I, it was just the difference, the, the, the Holy Ghost revival that had mm -hmm. broken out. Okay. And people were just in resistance of it. You know, today in 2010, I see revivals, I see Holy Ghost revivals breaking out because the world is in a shape today. People are looking for answers. Do you think in 1884 they were looking for answers? Oh, I believe they were hungry. I believe that the world had gotten complacent and somewhat arrogant, even mm -hmm. though it was sparse population here. Mm -hmm. There was still a, a tinge of arrogance, maybe, or, or whatever it was in that day. They were looking for a great move of God. And, mm -hmm. and you know, when, when God isn't in us to the fullest, the Bible proclaims that we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And, and when we're not full, I believe people search for it. And certainly this man did, and he had the determination to find God in the fullest. <clears throat> and he, he stuck in there. Oh, in fact, the... Mr. Sperling, R.G. Sperling, died that year. I believe it was 1886. He passed away, and his son continued the work, and the few handful of followers determined to make it go. Right. And, of course, today there are four million strong in the Church of God, and we're sitting on the Church of God of Prophecy property here mm -hmm. at Fields of the Wood, which were all one at one time because the Christian Union was then... Uh, changed the name was changed to the holiness church as more people began to join mm -hmm. and a man named tomlinson a i believe it was a j a l tomlinson uh then joined the church and he was one of the leaders of the church there was a rift that happened and they split and the church of god went one way and the church of god of prophecy went another but there was great revival here uh, the old shearer schoolhouse the site of it is still here not far from where we're sitting today. Right, I've been there. And that schoolhouse was burned down by... And rascals. actually it was their first meeting place. It was. And so it was burned down in, you know, basically to say, you're not going to do this. You're not going to worship God the way you want to. That's exactly that what That is happened. unbelievable. That is unbelievable. They, these people were shot at. They were stoned. They were just persecuted to the point where most people would give up and say, mm -hmm. you know, ha have it.
Four they million were strong, they did not give up. They, they were determined, uh -huh. and their missionary work, I can attest to the fact that, that it's effective there. In many parts of the world today, uh, seeing people saved by their missionaries. In fact, uh -huh. I was sharing that story with you earlier, a man that just preached at our church uh -huh. recently, who was part of a, of a uh, uh, what would you call it, not a mob, but a, a tribe in Africa. Uh -huh. And the missionary from the Church of God went there and began to preach. This man, this uh, fellow's grandfather was the witch doctor, the medicine man. And, of course, that was real resistance. And the young man was saved. He was the only one saved that day and, and came back mm -hmm. to America and, and attended Lee College and wound up preaching at our church. Wow. In fact, another interesting story. At the time, I was praying for a job. Uh, we had prayer. He laid hands on me and prayed after that service. And the next day, I won't go into all the detail, but I was called with the best job I ever had in my life. Isn't that something? And when I finally got to the company, they told me it was miraculous how that happened because the, the resume I had sent in was lost and whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I personally uh, was raised in the Catholic Church, and I found really found the Lord here in a true way uh -huh. and was saved and have been in the Church of God now for 35 years. Wow. Um, what does it mean to you to see this property where thousands and thousands of people used to visit? Truly, I've probably been here. Wow. I hope today's program has touched your heart. I hope the music has, has lifted and encouraged your heart. I hope that today you will look around and say, what can I do to make somebody else's life better? What can I do to make my own life better? Um, again, if you are battling alcoholism, if you are battling an addiction to drugs, if you are, you know, I know somebody trying to quit smoking really, really hard and having a really tough time with it. Whatever your, your addiction is, if, uh, if there's a problem, if there's something hurtful in your life, please try to turn it around. Wouldn't it be wonderful to do that Easter week? That would be incredible. I can't thank the folks enough who gathered yesterday. We had a very small group of, of loving friends who said we want to get to meet this baby that we've heard so much about. And some dear friends got to meet the, the light of our life. Um, Zanna is absolutely precious and we are so thankful to God for her and we do know that she is a miracle. And boy, is her mama a miracle because what a good little mama she is. And so to Ansley, to Zanna, we love you. To Riker, we love you. We are so blessed with great grandchildren, beautiful children. And um, that is part, part of what God delivers to us. He delivers us a miracle that we are now in charge of. So take your kids to church. Read the Bible to your children. Share the good news because there is a lot of good news in this horrible world. I'll see you again soon, only on ETC.